All right, so we are doing the little uh, pre-lab lecture that goes along with our lab for acids, bases, and buffers. For this one, you're gonna have a lab report and it follows all the standard format for the lab report. Then you're gonna have a next section that's calculations and that's gonna come from your lab manual, page 58, one through nine. Then you'll have that third section that's the additional problems and that'll be page 61, one through 10. I know it goes to 13, but you only have to do one through 10. Okay, so why do we really care about buffers? What's the whole purpose of a buffer? And the reason we want a buffer is because we want something that is going to resist changes in pH. Now, why is that important? Well, in the body, we have to keep all kinds of different pHs in a really, really tight range. For example, inside of your blood, your blood needs to be a particular pH so that all the right chemical reactions can happen at that pH. Now, different parts of the body require different pHs, but in general, whatever the pH is of that, that body part, that's where you need to stay in that range. And it's a very small range and you need to make sure that you stay within that small range. So a buffer will allow um, a resistance of changes in the pH so that it will stay at the same place. So what's an example? An example is carbonic acid, this is in your blood, ooh, carbonic acid and hydrogen carbonate. And this is in our blood. Okay, so what is carbonic acid? Maybe you know the formula, H2CO3, right? And then what's our hydrogen carbonate? That's HCO3 minus, right? Okay, so how does this help us to maintain our pH levels whenever we're adding additional acid, which is acidosis, or if we add additional base, which is alkalosis? And these two things happen all the time in the body, um, especially when we have parts of the body that stop working the way they're supposed to, like in heart failure, cancer, uh, seizures, liver failure. If you go without oxygen for a long time, you're going to get acidosis. Um, and alkalosis can also be caused by uh, various things happening inside of the body. So when you think about acidosis, you have to think about adding excess acid. And what kind of acid is the most dangerous thing to add? A strong acid, right? So what happens in a strong acid? A strong acid completely disassociates in water. So I can, in essence, write a strong acid as just H plus, right, our hydrogen ion. And I'll put that in parentheses as a strong acid. And so one part of this buffer up here that we have is going to actually combat the addition of that strong acid and prevent that strong acid from having a big pH change on the blood. So what part of our buffer system does that? Well, which one of those two compounds is actually going to soak up the hydrogen ion? And that is going to be our H. CO3, our hard hydrogen carbonate. So in the presence of hydrogen carbonate, if you add a strong acid, what you're gonna end up forming is H2CO3. You're gonna form the carbonic acid. When you form the carbonic acid, we are in essence converting this strong acid into a weak acid. So now you're gonna have less of a pH effect on the bloodstream, which is super, super, super important. Okay, we can do the same thing with alkalosis. Alkalosis is additional hydroxyl um, being added. So this is a strong base because we know a strong base will 100% disassociate in solution. So we can shorthand it that way. So what part of our buffer system is actually gonna pick up that OH minus? So it's gonna be the other part, right? The H2CO3, the carbonic acid, it's going to soak up the excess base. When that base is soaked up, what actually happens is that that hydrogen gets transferred, right? And so then you're gonna make HCO3 minus plus water. So the HCO3 minus the hydrogen carbonate, what is that? That's a weak base. So you converted something from a strong base to a weak base and you're gonna have less of an effect on the pH of the blood. So that's awesome, that's great. It's gonna, it's gonna help us to maintain that pH level. The, the, all of this, both of these two things that are happening simultaneously helps to maintain pH levels, right? And that's really important so that all of our normal biological functions are gonna happen, yay, right? <laughs> okay. 
So you need to be able to recognize any given system as a buffer or not. So what do you have to have in order to have a buffer? Well, you're gonna have to have one of two things. You're gonna either need a weak acid and it's conjugate base, or you can have a weak base and it's conjugate acid, right? Either combination works, but you need to have that, um, the, the conjugate, the weak acid in the conjugate or the weak base in the conjugate. Okay, so if we're in the lab and I tell you to go and make a buffer, the conjugate form is always gonna be found as, as a solid and it's gonna be found as a salt, right? So if I tell you to go and make it, if you're trying to go and find the conjugate base of hydrogen carbonate, you're gonna go actually find sodium hydrogen carbonate, right? So that's just what's in the cabinet. Okay. So the conjugates are always going to be found as a salt. Calculations for the buffer. We're going to use one formula over and over and over again, and that is the Henderson, Let's see if I can fit it all, uh, H-A-S-E-L-B-A-C-H, -E right? Henderson Hasselbach. And I abbreviate that just H-H equation. OK. So there are actually different definitions for acids and bases, kind of depending on who developed the definition. Um, and so if we, if we look from the very beginning, the first definitions were Arrhenius. Um, and so according to the Arrhenius definitions, um, an acid is always going to uh, produce H plus in solution, right? And so the opposite is going to be true for an Arrhenius base. An Arrhenius base is always going to produce OH minus in solution. But not all acids and bases fit that definition. So then we have a slightly better definition with the Bronsted-Lowry. Um, and in Bronsted-Lowry, what we say is um, that this acid, if you have a Bronsted-Lowry acid, it's going to donate a hydrogen ion. Bronsted-Lowry will then accept except a hydrogen ion, right? And in the last one, we really talk about in Lewis, right? If we're talking about Lewis, what are you thinking? You're thinking electrons. Um, a Lewis acid will actually accept a pair ooh, of electrons to form a bond, right? And these are just different definitions um, depending on what type of acid base it is. Ooh, why did I write accept again? Donate, donate a pair of electrons to form a bond, right? So those are just the different definitions of the acids and bases. Okay, so we've said that there are strong acids and bases and weak acids and bases. So how do we know that? How do we know um, if something's gonna be strong or not? Well, a strong acid or base will, like we said earlier, 100% disassociate in solution, right? And so um, I really do believe that you should memorize some of your big strong acids and strong bases. And so um, I have a little mnemonic that I use to remember my strong acids and my little mnemonic is I bring clay for our binary acid. So why does it I bring K clay? Because it's H-I, H-B-R, and H-C-L. So I bring clay. That gives me my binary strong acids. Then you have ternary at strong acids. So in these, you need two more oxygens than hydrogens, and it cannot contain any carbon. If you see carbon, automatically think it's weak. So two more hydrogens than oxygens. Um, let me give you some examples of that. H2SO4, right? That's sulfuric acid. So in this, you have two more oxygens. I have four oxygens here and I have two hydrogens here. You have to have at least two more. Another example of a strong would be HNO3, right? Nitric acid, nitric acid has three oxygens and only one hydrogen. So you still have two more oxygens than hydrogens. All right, strong bases. Our strong bases are group one hydroxides. Um, our strontium hydroxide, SROH2, right? And our barium hydroxides. And so what you kind of just have to remember, so that's our acids, I'm trying to 
keep it separate, um, is that NH3 is a weak base. So if you can kind of remember these little rules, this is gonna really help you easily recognize, is it strong, is it weak, that kind of thing. Okay, so next is to write a reaction with the disassociation of our strong acid and our strong base. Well, we already kind of talked about that, right? If we have HCl, what's gonna happen to HCl? HCl is gonna completely disassociate into H plus plus Cl minus. But you gotta kind of remember, right, that H plus doesn't actually exist in solution in um, real life, right? So what actually happens is it reacts with water and it forms our hydronium ion, which is the H3O plus. So if I wanted to rewrite this, technically it's in the presence of water. And what's gonna happen technically is I make my hydronium ion plus Cl minus, right? Okay, so let's do NaOH. What happens with NaOH? Complete disassociation, that's why I'm drawing just the one arrow instead of the double arrow. I get Na plus plus OH minus, okay? All right, so where do we get these definitions of strong acids and strong bases? Well, the strength of our acid or our base is dependent upon how much that, um, that hydrogen ion is going to disassociate in water by um, how much, I have to write as I talk, <laughs> um, hydrogen slash our hydroxide ion uh, disassociates in water, in water, right? So the more it disassociates, the stronger it is. So since strong acids and bases disassociate completely 100%, what can we talk about for our equilibrium constant? K, remember equilibrium constant is equal to our concentration of products over concentration of reactants, concentration. So what would we expect our equilibrium constant of a strong acid or a strong base to be? We would expect it to be greater than one. Because if you look at it, if you have HCl and HCl is gonna have a Ka because it's an acid, what we expect is it's gonna be greater than one. Why is it gonna be greater than one? Because you're making lots and lots and lots of product, right? Here are products. We're making lots and lots of products because it's all disassociating. Same thing with NaOH. You're making lots of products. So the Kb for NaOH is also gonna be greater than one. All right. So if we have a um, Ka for a general strong disassociation, we're gonna write that as HA, and we're gonna write a single arrow going in the forward direction, yields H plus plus A minus, right? So if we write this as a Ka, we write H plus times A minus over concentration HA, right? So Ka is going to be greater than one, so our forward reaction is favored, and that makes the numerator larger. Right? All right. So for strong acids and strong bases, it's super, super easy in order to determine the pH. So if I have a strong acid, how do I know my strong acid? I know that's the same thing as concentration of H plus because it disassociates 100% in solution. Same thing with a strong base, it's equal to our OH minus concentration. So a lot of times when we talk about um, pH, right? What, what is the P? What, what does that stand for? That all, all that we do is we're saying that that P stands for the negative log of something. So in this case, it's the negative log, concentration H plus. It's just an easier way to think about it because concentration, you get all these um, exponents that have positive and negative numbers. And sometimes that's hard for people to understand. So if you take the negative log of it, you take away those exponents. So all P means is the negative log. Right? Okay, so you have to remember um, two more formulas, right? So if we're talking about concentration of um, our, our hydrogen ions and our, our hydroxides, we know that the product of the two is going to be equal to, always equal to one times 10 to the negative 14 molar, right? Um, so, so that's one you need to remember. And the other thing you need to remember, and it's the same thing really, is that if I take the negative log of all that stuff, that's gonna tell me my pH plus 
my POH is equal to 14. It's the same, it's really the same equation. <gasps> kind of cool, right? Okay. And I know you've seen that before. All right, so let's let's do a couple of little practice things. And these practice things come out of your lab manual. So you should have read your lab manual. I guess I should have said that in the beginning. All right, so what's the pH of 0.1 molar HCl? So we know our formula, pH is equal to the negative log concentration of H plus, and we know that HCl is a strong acid, so HCl concentration is equal to H plus concentration, right? So our pH is equal to negative log, just plug it in, 0 0.01. So pH is equal to, plug it into your calculator, you should get two, okay? Do the same thing for, what is this? Oh, this is a strong base, right? Sometimes I like to just label them, strong acid, strong base. That way I kind of remember. All right, so I'm gonna do P. Now in this case, because we're a base, POH is equal to the negative log of OH minus. And we know we can do this because concentration of NOH NOAH is equal to concentration OH minus. So POH is equal to negative log of 0.01, right? Because that's the concentration we put up here. So POH is equal to two. Well, that's great, but that's not what I was asked for. I was asked for pH. So now I have to convert. pH plus POH is equal to 14. So that's pH plus two is equal to 14. So pH is equal to 12. Okay. So you have to be able to do that and recognize we're asking for pH or POH. Okay. Weak acids and bases. The definition of a weak acid and base is something that does not completely disassociate in solution. And so we use a double-sided arrow. Um, sometimes it's like that, right? But sometimes you'll see it like that, same thing. So we know the pH is equal to however much of our hydrogen ion dissociates. So the equilibrium expression for Ka, remember it's an acid Ka, can be used to calculate our pH. So generally, generally, the Ka of a weak acid and the Kb of a weak base is going to be very, very small. It'll be positive, but it'll be some number raised, some number times 10 raised to a negative exponent, right? So, so we know that not very much of it is disassociating. So it's going to be really, really small. Okay, so um, how do we relate that, right? Well, we don't always wanna talk about Ka because Ka is kind of hard to understand. So we convert that to pKa by taking the negative logs. So the negative log Ka, the pKa, right? So if our Ka is one times 10 to the negative 12, that's a really small Ka. Then what's our pKa? Our pKa is 12. Look how much bigger that pKa became, right? Okay. Same thing for a base, negative log of Kb is the pKb, and it should be small, pKb, right? So if our Kb is one time 10 to negative 12, then our pKb is 12, right? Okay, so let's do um, a, a math problem with a weak acid. So if we add 0 0.002 moles of our weak acid, acetic acid, and I'm telling you it has a pKa value of 4.76. And if you need to know a pKa value, I will give you a pKa value. You do not have to memorize tables of pKa values that will be given to you. So you have this weak acid um, in a flask and you bring up the volume to 100 milliliters. What's the concentration of the acid? Well, how do we figure out concentration? Concentration is molarity. So molarity is moles per liter, right? So in order to do that, we just need to know how many moles of our weak acid. We said that was 002 moles. And we're going to put that in to 100 milliliters. And 100 milliliters is the same thing as 0.1 liters. So make sure you have your right units. So that gives you 0.02 molar acetic acid. So HAC is the abbreviation for acetic acid, right? But you got to think about some of that um, acetic acid is going to break down, right? because we do have this equation, not very much of it, but a little bit of it is going to break down and we're gonna release um, a little bit of that hydrogen ion and we're gonna make a conjugate base. So what's the pH of this solution, right? How do we figure that out? Um, well, you could write out a dissociation reaction and then you could do um, a table 
I used to call them and I taught this a rice table because we live in Louisiana. Some people call it an ice table where you write the reaction out, you write the initial concentration, you write the change, um, and then you find the equilibrium values. But that's kind of a lot of work. We have a shortcut that we can use, right? Um, the short that, shortcut that we can use is the pKa minus the log of HA concentration divided by two, right? So this is a shortcut that is only good for weak acid solutions that go up to 0.1 molar um, and have a pKa as low as three. If you don't fit those criteria, you can't use it and you've got to do the long way. So let's use the shortcut. So in this one, what did we say? pKa was 4.76 right, minus the log, what was our concentration of HA? Our concentration was 0 0.02 molar HAC, right? And we're gonna take all that divided by two. When you do that, you should get 3.23. That's supposed to be a two. It's terrible. Two, 3.23, okay? All right, so now let's do an example of just a weak base. And this follows along in your lab notebook, in your lab manual, not your lab notebook. So in this case, we're gonna have a, we're gonna try to find the pH of a 0.02 molar sodium acetate um, solution. And sodium acetate is the weak base that's formed from acetic acid. So let's write our equation for that, right? Sodium acetate, NaAc, Ac is acetate, the abbreviation for acetate. We're putting it in water. And what's gonna happen? Is it gonna be a forward arrow or a double arrow? It should be a double arrow, right? Na plus plus, we're gonna make our conjugate acid. So if this was our weak base, this is gonna be our conjugate acid, right? Plus OH minus, okay? All right, so we, use, we can use a shortcut, another shortcut. So this is only good for weak bases pKa plus 14 plus the log of HA divided by two. Okay, so it's a really nice shortcut. All you have to do is plug in your formula, plug in your values into your formula, 4.76 plus 14 plus the log. And we were told it was 0.02 molar HAC. And we're gonna divide all that by two. Plug that in and you should get 8.35 for a pH, okay? And you should, kind of, you should kind of know, like you look at this example, it's a weak base. You should kind of know about what pH range you're looking for. Um, it shouldn't be really, really, really high and it shouldn't be an acid, <laughs> same thing. So look at your answers and make sure they kind of make sense. All right, polyprotic acids. Polyprotic acids are pretty cool. These are acids that have more than one hydrogen that can disassociate from them. So each time a hydrogen disassociates, that individual hydrogen has its own uh, pKa value. And you can see on page 46, there's a table and page 54, there are tables um, that, that show you this. So go to page 46 and find phosphoric acid, K2PO4. Um, so let's look at each of this, these disassociation events, right? So what do, you, what do you start with? Well, if you start with H3PO4, what's gonna end up happening in a reversible way, right? Because these are weak. You're gonna form hydrogen ions plus, right? You have one hydrogen that's gonna disassociate. So what are you left with? H2PO4 minus. So this has a Ka and we call it Ka1 because it's the first hydrogen, this is always gonna be the largest one. Um, so we're just gonna write largest. It doesn't really matter what the value is. I just want you to understand that it's gonna have the largest Ka value. So if you take that and convert that to a pKa, because this is kind of really how we think about it, you get a pKa of 2.21. So what do you think is gonna happen, right? If our Ka goes from largest, we should go smaller and then even smaller, each time we disassociate, right? So this is Ka2, Ka3. So then what do you think is gonna happen to our pKa values every time we have a subsequent hydrogen disassociation? We expect to see it go up. So our next reaction, right? We're gonna take our product here and use it as a reactant, H2PO4 minus. 
in a reversible way is going to disassociate a hydrogen and we're left with HPO4 two minus, right? And that pKa value does go up and you get 7.21. Then we're going to disassociate another one. So we're going to take our product, make it a reactant, HPO4 two minus. In a reversible way, we're going to lose our hydrogen and we're going to end up with PO4 three minus. Three minus, right? So what happens, that, that KA is getting smaller and smaller. So our pKa we expect to go up and it does 12.32. Supposed to be a two. Okay, 12.32. So um, when the pH of your solution is equal to the pKa, then what is that telling you, right? So why is it important to know the pKa? Because that's the point at which the two forms right? So let's look at the very last reaction. These two forms are going to be in equal concentrations in your solution when your pH is equal to the pKa. So at pH 12.32, you're going to have an equal amount of HPO4 two minus as you do PO4 three minus, right? So, so if you look at the ratio, right, that ratio should equal to one. So at pH two, let's look at pH two, right? So look up above, right? At pH two, wow, you're really close. You're almost exactly on the pKa value. So approximately, we're not gonna say perfect, but approximately your pH is equal to your pKa. So in this case, you should have equal concentrations of H3PO4 and H2. H3PO4, H2PO4 minus, right? So that, that gives you an idea of what species are present at the various pHs, and you can use the pKa value to determine that. So, all right, uh, let's see. Um, we already wrote out those equations. Okay, so the other thing that we have to talk about in terms of a polyprotic acid um, is when you have two pKa values. So if you have an intermediate of your polyprotic acid, your pH is going to be controlled by, um, by those, both of those pKa values. So what you do is you take the average of the two. Um, so if you have, for example, uh, pKa1, pKa2, um, when you divide by two, right, then that's telling you now you're going to have this combination of um, where, where are we at? Let's see, let's scroll up. Our PO4 three minus and our HPO4, right? So here and here. It's gonna be controlled by multiple uh, pKa values. All right, buffers. This is a big one, right? What happens if we add both a weak acid and a weak base? Up until this point, we've kind of only talked about one. Either it's a weak acid or it's a weak base. But if we add both to the same solution, what are we gonna get? we get a buffer, right? And so you can look at, for example, sodium acetate. If we add sodium acetate to water, we're gonna have a weak base. Um, that weak base will disassociate the salt, so the Na will come off and we'll make um, our acetic acid and that's our conjugate acid and then we'll have OH minus, right? So now um, we have our sodium, acid, our sodium acetate um, forming our conjugate acid and we have them in the same solution. So what two reactions are actually going on, right? We have HAC, that's one of the species present. And what's gonna happen in a reversible way is that we're gonna make H plus plus our acetate, right? So we are starting out with a weak acid and we're gonna make a conjugate base. Well, what's the other thing that's happening? Well, we have our sodium acetate in the presence of water and what's gonna happen in a reversible way is we're gonna disassociate that sodium ion plus HAC plus OH minus. So we have our weak base and our, over here, conjugate acid, right? So we actually have two reactions that are happening simultaneously in the solution. And so how do you calculate the pH of this, right? You don't just have one thing going on, so you can't just use the formulas that we've used in the past. Um, so how do you calculate the pH of the solution. Well, the two reactions actually cancel each other out. And so um, really because both of these species are weak, we have a weak acid and a weak base, the reactions don't actually happen that much. You're, remember, we, that's why we use that reversible arrow. 
So to find the pH, what we're going to do is we're going to use the Henderson Hasselbach. So here's Henderson Hasselbach. pH is equal to pKa plus the log of the concentration of A minus over concentration HA, right? Now, we use brackets in the formula and we say concentration, but that ratio can either be concentration or it can be moles because it's just a ratio. And as long as the units are the same, they will cancel out. So it can either be in concentration and molarity or it can be in moles, either way, it doesn't matter. All right, so let's try to use this. So what's the pH of a solution where you add 0 0.001 moles of sodium acetate, um, of acetic acid, sorry, of acetic acid to 0 0.002 moles of sodium acetate and bring the volume up to 100 milliliters with water. Okay, so just use your Henderson Hasselbach, right? So we know pH is equal to our um, pKa plus the log, oh, it's right there, I'm gonna have to rewrite that. H A. Whoa. Right. Okay. So our pH is equal to 4.76 because that's the pKa. So you have to go back and you have to, you have to go and find the pKa values, um, but they'll be in tables. They'll be given to you, right? Plus the log. Uh, now in this, in this, I'm just going to use moles because it's given to me both in moles. So I don't need to worry about it. So now the only thing is, which one's the acid and which one's the conjugate base. So you have to be very, very careful about that. Um, in this case, it's our sodium acetate that goes on top, 0 0.002, I don't know what this is, okay, over our concentration and we had 0 0.001, okay? So when you plug that into your calculator and really it's the log of the ratio, right? So what do you get? You should get a pH of 5.06, right? So now you have a buffer. Yay, congratulations, you have a buffer. What's it good for? It's really good for if I want to soak up excess H plus or OH minus. Remember, we said either one. We can add either a strong base or a strong acid, and my buffer is going to actually soak it up, right? Okay, so um, let's, let's look at some little more complex examples. We have two systems. System A is 0.1 liters of pure water. Pure water should be pH seven. System B is 0.1 liter of 0 0.1 molar phosphate buffered solution. We, we abbreviate that PBS. We use PBS in lots of things in the lab. And this has a pH of 7.2. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add a strong acid, I'm gonna add 10 mils of 0 0.001 molar hydrochloric acid to each of them. What is going to happen to the pH of each system? So I'm challenging each system with a strong acid, what's gonna happen? Well, in order to, to answer that question, I need to know how many moles of my strong acid I'm actually adding. So in order to find moles, I'm gonna do is equal to, right, liters times molarity. So my moles is how many liters, um, what do I have? I have 0.1 liters, right? And uh, what's my concentration? 0 0.001 moles, right? So how many moles of my acid did I actually add? I added one times 10 to the minus five moles of H plus, okay? And the other thing is, what's my final volume? I added some water, some liquid to the solution. And so that changes my final volume. So I need to monitor and keep in mind my final volume, right? I had 0.1 liter and I added 10 milliliters to that. So that's 0 0.01 liters, I get 0 0.11 liters, right? So just keep that in mind. So how do I find out my uh, concentration of hydrogen ion? Because that's gonna tell me my pH. So my concentration of H plus is going to be the moles that I've added here, one times 10 to the minus five moles, right? I have to divide that by my volume. My new volume is 0 0.11 liters, right? So that's 9.09 .09 times 10 to the minus five molar. So from there, I can calculate pH, right? pH is equal to the negative log 
concentration H plus equal to negative log of, I'm just gonna do this. And then it's going to equal 4.04. .04. So what happened to my pH? pH went from seven to 4.4. .4. Wow, that's a drop. Now, system B. System B, I have a buffer. I have 0.1 liters of 0.1 molar PBS. And to that, I add 10 mils of my 0.001 molar hydrochloric acid. So you got to remember that a pH of 7.2 is equal to the pKa of our phosphoric acid. So at pH 7.2, we have equal concentrations of our HA and our A minus. Okay. So that's just kind of a thing to keep in mind. So let's talk about what we have to start with. We're starting with PBS. We have 1 mol 0.1 molar PBS, right? And in that 0.1 molar PBS, I have 0.1 liters, which gives me how many moles? 0 0.01 moles of PBS. So if I'm at the equivalence point, right? Um, if, if my pH is equal to the pKa, 7.2, that's, that's the pKa. So I know that my concentration of HA is equal to concentration A minus, right? That's, that's the definition. So the total moles, so HA is equal to A minus, and our total moles is equal to 0 0.01, right? That's total. Then half of them must be HA and half of them must be A minus. So what you're going to have are 0 0.005 moles of H2PO4 minus and 0 0.005 moles of HPO42 minus, right? You have equal um, numbers of moles of each. All right, so now that I know my moles of each, I can calculate my, my, P, my pH value, right? So if I don't do anything to the system, let's just, let's just plug it in. I haven't challenged the system yet. pH is equal to pKa plus the log of A minus over HA, right? So pH is equal to pKa plus the log of, I'm gonna plug them in, HPO42 minus over H2PO4 minus, right? So plug in your values, that's 7.2 plus the log of 0 0.005 over 0 0.005. And so what you should get, right, is a log of one, this is, this is going to equal to the log of one. And you know the log of one is equal to zero. So this whole thing here is gonna to equal to zero. So what should you get? 7.2, right? That's how I know that my pH and my pKa value um, give me the same ratio of A minus to HA. Okay, now, ooh, I need another page. <laughs> okay, so now, now that I have my buffer, I'm gonna challenge it. I'm going to add to this buffer 1 times 10 to the minus 5 moles of H plus, right? Because that's what, that's what we calculated up here, that when we added that acid, we're adding the same amount. So it's 1 times 10 to the minus 5 moles of our acid or H plus. So what happens? What actually happens in that solution? So for every mole of H plus that we add, what's gonna happen is our H plus is gonna react with HPO42 minus, and what are we gonna form? H2PO4 minus, right? It's actually that way, but. So if we add one times 10 to the minus five moles of H plus, what's gonna happen? You're actually going to add one times 10 to the minus five moles of H2PO4 minus, right? That's the bottom term in our henderson hasselbach and then we're going to lose that same amount of HPO4, two minus, right? Because it's actually going to, um, it's gonna react and it's gonna, it's gonna be lost, right? Okay, so now use your henderson hasselbach equation again. pH is equal to 7.2 plus the log, right? And you have to say how many moles you're starting with. We're starting with five times 10 to the minus three moles. And from that, we are going to lose one times 10 to the minus five. 
And then at the same time we lose, we're gonna gain on the bottom. We're gonna start with five times 10 to the minus three because we started with an equal ratio and we're gonna gain one times 10 to the minus five, right? So now what's our pH? 7.198, what was it before? What did we start with? 7.2 and we added acid to it and we're still at about 7.2. Isn't that awesome? This is the whole point of a buffer. The whole point of a buffer is that the pH doesn't change. If I had pure water, that's what I did in system A. Where is system A? Here we go, system A. We started with pure water at pH seven, we added hydrochloric acid to it. And what happened? The pH went down to 4.04. .04. Wow, that's huge. But when we did that to our buffer system, we did we added the same amount of hydrochloric acid. We went to 7.198. Basically, it didn't change. That's the point of a buffer. Isn't that perfect and wonderful and amazing? Gotta love that. Okay. All right. So here's our summary, our answer, right? If you have an unbuffered system, that's just water. We went from pH 7 to pH 4.04. .04. And here our pH. Our PBS buffered solution, we went from pH 7 to pH 7.198. That's amazing, yay. Okay, some other um, key points that you need to keep in mind when you're, you're doing these kinds of um, stuff in a lab, right? Um, you can also make a buffered system a little easier. You can take a weak acid and you can actually add strong base to that weak acid until your pKa reaches until your pH reaches the pKa of the buffer. And then you're only making one solution and then you add, you're just adding an acid to it or, an, or a base, it depends, right? So if you have a weak acid and you titrate with a strong base to get to your pH or you start with a weak base and you add a strong acid to get to the, uh, to make the pH equal to the pKa. This is a really easy way to make a buffer you need to be able to recognize a strong acid or base, a weak acid or a weak base and a buffer. You need to be able to do that. Um, the other thing is the higher the concentration of the buffer, the stronger the buffering capacity is. So if you only have a 0.1 molar buffer, you have a 0.1 molar PBS buffer, um, you're gonna be able to convert more hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions into weak acids and weak bases rather than a 0 0.001 molar buffer. So the higher the concentration of buffer, the more um, it can soak up, right? Just because you have more um, moles of, of each of those weak acids or weak bases, right? So the most effective buffer, the most effective buffer is one that is used at its pKa. And why is that? Because, like you really need to know this because when your pKa is equal to the pH, you have equal amounts of the acid and base form. So you can buffer an equal amount of acid being added and an equal amount of base being added. But any given buffer is only good for one plus or minus one pH value from its pKa. So if you add enough acid or enough base, that that pH drops below one pH value of the pKa, it's no longer a buffer. Or if you add enough that it raises, right? If it's higher than one pH from its pKa, then you no longer have a buffer. So that tells you that your ratio of um, HA to A minus is not one anymore. It gets to 10, right? So if you have a ratio of 10, what's that actually telling you? You have 91% that's in the acid form and only 9% in the base form. So that's not a buffer. The other thing practically that you should know is that temperature can affect buffers. And this is due to thermal expansion. So a lot of times um, if you make a buffer at room temperature, and then let's say you're gonna use it in a protein purification and you need to incubate it at a, a lower degree or a higher degree, you should recheck the pH when it's at that temperature that you really want it to be because it can actually change. So we talked about two ways that you can make a buffer. You can add both HA and A minus in solution, or this is the easier way, easier way, 
you can add, you can make your, your, um, uh, your HA and then you add strong base to it or vice versa. You have A minus and you titrate with a strong acid. And all the time you're trying to make the pH equal to the pKa. Then you have a buffer. Until you get to that point, you don't have a buffer. All right, uh, let's see. Okay, so let's, let's look at one example. Um, if we have uh, acetic acid, HAC, right? And if we add sodium hydroxide to it, what's gonna happen? Well, uh, you are gonna form water, you're gonna form acetate, and then you're gonna form that sodium ion. So for every molecule of sodium hydroxide that you add, one molecule of your acetic acid is going to be converted into acetate, right? So you, you have to remember that when you're counting those moles and doing those calculations. Um, and so you're gonna use your pH meter while you add sodium hydroxide, you're gonna monitor the whole time you're adding sodium hydroxide, right? And you're gonna monitor that pH until you get to the point where um, the, the sodium, the, uh, the acetate is equal to uh, the acetic acid. And so this, this refers to the point where pH, hello, pH is equal to pKa. And you have, yay, a buffer, yay. Okay, so the only problem is that once you do that, you need to make sure your concentration is correct. So say you want 100 milliliters of some buffer at 0.1 molar, and you have a stock that's at 0.2 molar, right? How do you make sure not to exceed 100 milliliters? So what I would do is I would take maybe 50 milliliters of our 0.2 molar, so yeah. okay, and then I'm going to, that's my, that's my initial um, uh, solution. And I'm going to add NaOH, right? To reach my pH, to reach uh, pH equal to pKa, right? Then once I get that done, now I'm gonna fill to 100 milliliters. Now I have a 0.1 molar buffer that is at the correct pH, okay? So I don't wanna start out with 100 mils of 0.2 molar um, because then if I add liquid sodium hydroxide, that's gonna change my final volume. So it wouldn't work. All right, our very last example. How do you make 100 mils of 0.1 heps? Heps is another type of buffer that is uh, pH 7.55 if you only have a solid. So this is an example where you actually have to measure out the solid, and this is what you're actually gonna do in lab. You need to go and find the molecular weight. So there's a table in your book that gives you that, and you should look and make sure that the molecular weight on the bottle you're using is the same as the molecular weight of what you think you're supposed to be using in your book. They should match. Okay, so 238.3 grams per mole. Now. Is this the acid form or is this the base form? This is the acid form. Okay, you need to know that. So now I wanna know how many moles of this do I actually need, right? Moles, so it's <clears throat> 2.38 grams um, divided by 238.3 grams per mole. That gives me 0 0.01 moles, right? So what I wanna do is I wanna to add to that, I wanna add 100 milliliters. So what does that give me? Well, if I have 0.01 moles per 100 milliliters, that gives me a 0.01 moles per 0.1 liters, gotta make sure my units are right, gives me a 0.1 molar, okay? So that's the, that's the, the thing, but you want to make sure um, when you're doing this that you don't add um, too much water, right? So, so add maybe 50 to 80 milliliters of water to the solid, right? I don't want to add my whole 100 milliliters because what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to resuspend the solid and now I have to titrate. I have to add either a strong base uh, or a strong acid in order to make that pH equal to the pKa. So then add, and in this case, what would we want? If this is the acid form, I'm gonna to want to add a strong base to titrate 
pH to equal pKa, right? Um, and so you have to be careful in the lab because in the lab we have a lot of different concentrations of our strong acids and strong bases. Um, and if you need to change pH a lot, you wanna use something really high, like maybe three molar. We have some six molar, be careful, it's very dangerous. Um, but if you only wanna change the pH a little bit, then you wanna use something um, a, a much lower in concentration. So like your one molar or something like that. So be careful with that. So then once you've gotten that titrated in, you've resuspended your solid in water, you've added your strong base or your strong acid, now you're gonna fill to 100 milliliters. Right? I don't want to. I don't want to take my solid and immediately add 100 milliliters. Then I'm going to go over because I'm adding a liquid, either strong base or strong acid. Okay. So this is just kind of a quick rundown of um, what's going to happen. In part A, you're going to prep two different buffers. You can prep one phosphate um, and citrate, and the other is one that is not a phosphate and not a citrate. So there'll be examples in the lab, and I'll show you but you're gonna want 100 milliliters of your buffer at 0 0.01 molar. And I just kind of showed you how to do that, right? So if you want something um, that is 0 0.1 molar, 0 0.1 moles per liter, right? Times 0 0.1 liters, that gives you 0 0.01 moles. And then all you do is times your molecular weight, which is grams per mole. And that gives you the grams you wanna add. Be able to do this. Be able to do this. Okay. And you remember you're gonna take your um take your salt and you're gonna put it in, right? You're gonna put it into a beaker. There goes your solid. You're gonna measure it in, right? And then you're gonna add 50 to 80 milliliters, 80 milliliters of water. Then you're gonna titrate. And then you're gonna use a graduated cylinder. Oh, imagine that, right? And you're gonna fill to. 100 milliliters with water, right? Okay, now, um, how do you know how far to titrate it? You're gonna have to use your book. And you're gonna have to titrate to make the pH equal to the pKa. So make sure that you, you bring your lab book. Um, the pH meters are calibrated. I know in the procedure it says um, that it's, you need to do it, but it's been done for you. Um, so just skip that part. All right, part B, effective concentrations. Remember we, we talked about how concentration can affect uh, pH. So you're gonna take one of your um, solutions that you made, one of your buffers that you made from part A, that is at 0.1 molar. You're gonna dilute to 0.01 molar. That's your dilution one. Then you're gonna do a serial dilution. So you're gonna take dilution number one, that is at 0.01 molar. You're going to dilute it to make one that is 0.001 molar. And then lastly, um, measure the pH of all the solutions. Okay. Uh, part C, measurement of water and an unknown. Um, really simple. Just take the pH. Part D, why is a buffer a buffer? You're going to take 50 mils of one of your stock 0.1 molar buffers that you did in A. So this is from A. And you're going to add uh, a half a mil of either hydrochloric acid or sodium hydroxide. And how do you know which one to use? If your pH is greater than your pKa, add hydrochloric acid. If your pH is less than your pKa, add sodium hydroxide, okay? And then record your pH change after that addition. And then the second one is to repeat it, but use 50 mils of water instead of uh, 50 mils of your stock buffer. But use the same, if you, add, if you use HCl here, use HCl in two, okay? And that is it, all right.